I'm going to miss a couple of Wednesdays. Um, one, because of Army. You might say, what? Yeah. My Army schedule is changing a little bit. I'll talk with the deacons about that tonight. But, um, and then there's another one I'm missing for some reason. I can't remember why right now. So I'm going to try to cover a chapter a night. Now what that's going to mean is, come on in. What's that, so what that's going to mean is less in-depth, probably. And that's okay. That's okay. We can do a little bit uh, less in-depth. But I also don't want to squelch any conversation. So if you have a thought, don't say to yourself, well, we got to get through this. we got to press on. Go ahead and say it. Go ahead and mention it. Ask the question, whatever the case may be. But we got to finish Mark chapter 9 first. Now, because we're going to be racing a little bit, I'm just going to do the reading. Does that sound fair? That way we're not waiting around to see who's going to volunteer and all that sort of thing. Verse 42. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hang, hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with the fire. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Um, if, if you were to summarize that little section, how would you summarize it? What is he saying? Explain it to us. Explain it like somebody's five years old. What would you say? Yeah, you, that's a really good way to put it. I, I summarize it this way: the pleasure of sin isn't worth the price you'll pay. But we said the same thing, huh? <laughs> that's when you teach him. Remember that spanking you got? <laughs> um, and that you know we could spend an entire week on every one of these paragraphs, but because we're trying to get through chapter 10 tonight, we're not going to spend a lot of time here. But you know what I thought? Um, there's another corollary here here as well. He starts off with these words. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him, and he goes on. Right before that, in chapter 35, when they're arguing about who's the greatest, I'm sorry, verse 35, when they're arguing about who's the greatest, remember what he does? He, he finds a little child and pulls him in and says, look at verse 35 and 36. If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them and taking him in his arms said to them, whoever receives one such child. And we talked about how, I think this was last week, we talked about how Jesus cares about those that are Easily, what a child is not only insignificant, but easily led astray. And that's what we see in verse 42. He says, whoever causes one of these little ones, what's the context to demand there? He's talking about little children specifically. But I think the answer also could be broadened out to anybody that's easily led. And you know, as a pastor, this is a big deal to me. Because... I mean, whether it's whether you should or not, people listen to me. <laughs> so what I say, I mean, if I came up with some crazy thing and I said it, a lot of people would believe it, whether they should or not. And that's because the Bible places a lot of responsibility on leaders, not just pastors, not just Sunday school teachers, but I can think of leaders in here who are leaders just by virtue of having children. It's important. And by the way, you know, you ever heard that, that saying, more is caught than taught? More is. more is caught than taught. Kids watch how you live more. I mean, they'll listen to you, but they're also going to watch you. You know, you tell me to make my bed every day, but your room looks like a bomb went off. 
They're not, they're not, huh? Right. You say don't cuss. I cuss. I mean, not. <laughs> you cuss is what I meant to say. You say fill in the blank. And the reality is we are leading. And so Jesus is not saying, I don't think he's giving people an out. Like, like uh, maybe if you don't want to lead anybody astray, then don't, don't take the position of leadership. I think everybody leads in one respect or another because everybody's watching. But there are certain people that are, that are more dependent on you, your words, your actions, than others. Isn't kind of what it said? It's not put stumblers out there for people. Yeah. Even your own self. Yeah. I remember when I was a kid, looking back on it, I disagree with the application of it, but there was a lot of people in the churches that I went to and hung, people I hung out with that said it's wrong for Christians to go to movie theaters. Do you know... Does anybody remember that argument? What, what do you think the argument would be? No one today I can understand it. <laughs> I'll tell you. The argument was, if anybody sees you go in there, they don't know what. What movie you're going to go see. You might be going to watch The Last Temptation of Christ or some other movie with lots of nudity and cussing. and all. Of course, now... We, those kind of arguments don't make much sense anymore because any movie in the world you want, you can stream right to your phone, much less the TV. But do you, even though I disagree with the application, can you see the heart behind that? The heart was, we don't want to put a stumbling block in front of people. I disagree with that particular argument, but I like the heart. So I want to ask you, it, you, know, you don't have to get personal if you don't want to, but you can. Have you ever given up something? Not just to follow Jesus, but because you said, you know what, I don't want anybody, I don't want to cause anybody to stumble. Has anybody here, you got a testimony? Go ahead. Uh, cigarettes. I started smoking cigarettes when I was about a sophomore in college, and I was a heavy smoker up until about 30 years ago. <laughs> I guess it's been a while. Been a long, been a while. But, but I have smoked for about 30 years, though. Oh, wow. Been, you know, about 25. And I did that, and I had quit smoking a bunch of times, but that night that I lay down, and I, I was doing this right here, I said, well, dog, I'm out of cigarettes. I don't know if I can get up and go buy me a pack of cigarettes or not. And I said, no, no, wait, at least I won't smoke a cigarette between now and in the morning if I don't go get one. And like I said, I was a heavy smoker. I smoked two packs a day, easy. Oh, man. Wow. You know. And uh, when I said my prayers that night, I prayed and asked the good Lord to take the habit away from me. I was really sincere. But I had prayed it before, but I was sincere this time. But when I woke up the next morning, I didn't have the urge or a habit to smoke a cigarette. And I have not, not to this day. I don't pat up here and have a sip of cigarettes in my pocket, you know. Uh, we know where Horace kept them. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Anybody else got one? Even before I was. Yeah. Anything that, and by the way, not everything is necessarily in that category that we give up. But Jesus says there are some things that are so serious, it's either me or that. You can't do both at the same time. He says something else similar. He says you can't follow, you can't serve God and mammon or money. Right. That is a good. He said, "If it doesn't honor God, you ought not to be doing it." That's a, that's a good uh, rule of thumb to live by. And the question then inevitably becomes: 
What does, see, we could be on this one passage all night. What does, what honors God? What doesn't honor God? Um, I remember having a discussion with a guy once. It, it, it ended up getting silly. It, it, well, it ended up, well, that's right. And the Spirit might speak to each person a little bit different, right? Now, some things are black and white. Is that pretty obvious? I can't say, well, the Spirit is unclear whether or not I should go out and have dinner with that woman. The Spirit's clear about that because the, the Bible's clear. clear. <laughs> because the Bible's clear about that. You don't need the Holy Spirit to take that. <laughs> okay. An example of it not being clear for me would be... Um, Cutting the grass on Sunday afternoon. I know for me, growing up, that was a no-no. Well, I wouldn't do it. I was raised that way. Right. Set it apart. Huh? Or what if you have cows? You got to go out there and milk those cows or chickens or. What about gray areas? I think Paul talked about some gray areas sometimes. Well, that's kind of what we're talking about. Well, you know, if I if I go to your house and we're having a, a good dinner and you serve wine and it's okay with you and you're completely used to that. You know, if a person's a, a diehard, you shouldn't drink any alcoholic beverage whatsoever. It's wrong. That's kind of a gray area. You know, I think Paul was saying if it's going to cause your brother to stumble, don't do it in front of him. But at the same time, it might well, not be simple for you to drink the wine. Right. I, I think what Jesus says here does go very well. And the, the passage that you're referencing is 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And I think also Romans 14. Don't quote me on that. But uh, you had a thought, Matt? Well, I was just saying that the stone of water you're talking about the wine, if your friend you're inviting over is a previous alcoholic, you should definitely refrain from bringing the wine. Amen to that. Um, but if it's a couple that you hang out with on a regular basis, and the brother and the sister that are over there are not alcoholics, and they're good members of the church, then I don't, I don't think that that would be the stumbling block of the sin that you do not hide. Or like I said, if you invite over your friend, We could spend a lot of time on this, but l let me try to summarize. I think we would all agree with this statement. If there's a question about it in your mind, especially concerning what somebody else, how they might take it, especially if they're an immature believer. Remember, he, he said whoever calls one of these little ones. Are we talking just about little children here or maybe immature believers as well? Well, John does in First John, my little children. That's true. That's a good point. That's a good. That's a really I, I good. I think you relate directly to the other verses that you mentioned about the brothers and sisters. You know, the same one where he's talking about, you know, where calls your brothers don't, yeah. don't do it. Yeah. And that's just directly correlated with that. I agree. I agree. So we need to be super careful about pressing our liberties too far. We might can say, oh, I don't find anything in the Bible about this. I mean, is there anything in the Bible about marijuana? I don't see a bright red blinking sign, but I wouldn't do it. And I would say it's probably wise not to do it, just based on what it does to you and what it, how it could lead other people astray. But let's not get off topic too far. Does it honor God? Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do. Now, of course, somebody say, well, does, does, uh, does ice cream honor? <laughs> let's go to the next section, verses 1 through 12. And he left there. And went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan, and crowds gathered to him again, as they always did. And again, as was his custom, custom, he taught them. And Pharisees came up in order to test him. That's key, right? Asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, what did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. From the beginning 
of creation. God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. All right. So my summary of this. And by the way, this is a really good um, practice for you to do for yourself sometimes. Read a passage of scripture and then try to boil it down to one sentence. One you have to study it to do that. You can't just say, well, blah, it means that. That's a really good exercise for you to do. My summary of this, um, and it's okay if you disagree. I want to know if you disagree, is this. Divorce is a result of sin and causes sin. Now, I can already see, because in my own mind, I'm thinking, wait a minute, there's exceptions of course there are of course there are but what do you think is G what if you were just look at jesus's words is divorce is, is divorce ever the result of no sin there's always some sin involved right and in many cases what jesus is saying here is it also causes sin um this is not a teaching that modern Christians take very seriously, I don't think, at least, and I know the world doesn't. Um, what do you think? What are some thoughts about this passage? I, I want to hold back my thoughts and give you some chance to breathe a little bit. What, are you, what do you think? Well, so the question is, if someone is made to commit a... Let, let's say I divorced now. Now, we don't live in this kind of culture where a woman had to get remarried basically and that's why jesus says you make her commit adultery because a woman pretty much had to get remarried uh, and, starve or starve to death or going to prostitution none of those are good options so he says you make her commit adultery by doing that so that's an interesting way to put it here's my question is any sin beyond the pale of God's forgiveness? No. no. It is not. Therefore, uh, you know, I just use myself as an example again. If I committed adultery, uh, obviously I would be disqualified from serving here, but would God still forgive me? Yeah. Well, yeah, of course. Of course. That's, it always requires faith and repentance. Every sin does. Um, That's right. That's right. You know, the people that talk about pre-salvation, uh, post-salvation, I never, I don't really understand that argument. It might be true, but Jesus doesn't talk about it. Paul doesn't talk about it. Nobody really talks about those exceptions. By the way, is there another exception to a legit... Now, actually, Jesus doesn't even mention the exception. There is an exception clause that Jesus mentions. I, I don't have it right in front of me. But what is the exception? Well, there's two if there's sexual immorality, but Jesus doesn't mention the second one. No, I mean, what is? They married someone who isn't a believer. I mean, when they married the foreigners, they said, "Okay, everybody get a divorce." I mean, it was basically decreed. Ezra, go get a right? Because that was a little different. It was pulling them away. From <laughs> right, but Paul says in First Corinthians seven. I'll just use myself as an example again. If I was a believer, and let's say me and Natalie got married, and then I got saved, and she didn't. Well, there were, there were believers in Corinth who were saying things like, and you can, by the way, another really good Bible study tip. You can figure out a lot of what the people in the churches were saying by how Paul answers the question. You don't even see the question, but you can figure out what the question is. So Paul goes and says, if, if you're a believer and you're married to an unbeliever, do not divorce them. So what were they asking? 
Should I, first of all, must I divorce them because you said don't be equally, unequally yoked together. Do I have to divorce them? Number two, I really want to be married to a saved person. Can I divorce them? I mean, that's, that's the way I think about these things. This, this is, these are the questions they were asking. And he says, no. But he does say, if they leave, and he uses this word, you are no longer under bondage. And I take that to mean, you're no longer, you are free to remarry. Now, there are people that are much more conservative than I am on that point, and they don't agree with that at all. But I think God has grace here. A couple of different points here that I had here is that some things are a concession to our fallen nature and not the way it should be. That's what I was going to say. It was intended never to be like that. That's right. So, I mean, the only reason it ended up being that way is because of people. I mean, we're, we're sinful people. That's right. And that's why the whole thing came about. I mean, for Pete's sake, God gives... Isn't it, isn't it really ironic... Maybe irony is not the right word. It's mind-boggling that God does not outlaw slavery in the Old Testament. Instead, he regulates it. Mm -hmm. That's a concession to their fallen nature. God, by doing that, is not saying, go slavery, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> I think he's just saying, you know what? I'm going to have to put up with these people. They're so far behind the eight ball. I'm going <laughs> to give them some rules for how to do this instead of just saying, don't do it at all. Um, number two, and this is just kind of a minor point, but Jesus obviously believed in a literal interpretation of Genesis. Right? From the beginning of creation. He doesn't say from the Big Bang. He doesn't say the first hominid species that developed consciousness. He says from the beginning of creation. He believed in literal Genesis, and so do I. Uh, number three, God defines marriage. We were having this discussion with Salem and Malachi the other day. I forget why. Why were we talking with them about that? I think we were listening to Oh, yeah, that's right, that's right. And, uh, man, there's lots of people. If you don't teach your kids, they're going to absorb what the culture teaches them. I can promise you that. Um, let me ask this question. <laughs> I probably shouldn't. We're going to run out of time. How would church culture change if we took these words of Jesus incredibly seriously? You know, we, we hear Jesus say, love your enemies, and we're like, yeah, that's exactly what it means. We hear Jesus say, uh, you cannot serve God in money. That's exactly what it means. You shall not divorce. Oh, wait a minute. This is sticky. And there, let's, let's be honest. Why is it sticky? Let's talk about it. Because we are trying to reach. Because there's people that divorce in the church. Right. Well, that's a bad mistake to get into. If you're married to the wrong person, it's not working out. The sin is building up. That's a hard life to live. That's a very so hard. a lot of times, <laughs> we're about to have some testifying in here. So what if? So, if you are a safe person and you are in a marriage where I feel like you really need to divorce because it's not working out, then living that life is probably just miserable. Well, I think it's miserable. It's miserable because you put yourself in that position. I've been there before. It's a mistake with the sin in my life. However, um, it's still not right. But you have to give it in other words. <laughs> but then, okay. then it was, are you praying? That's stupid. You're reading the Bible? That's stupid. And it, I was beaten down until I prayed quietly. No one knew I prayed. No one knew I was a Christian because I was so treated so badly. They pulled me away from God. So I think, yes, it, it, you can actually, me, divorcing him brought me closer to God. I can actually openly say I'm a Christian. I can openly pray. And I couldn't. But it was still the result of some sin. Yes. Perhaps not your own. And here's... 
may I use you as a personal example since you, since you started? If, if, if we taught our young people, those kids over there right now, you should not even date somebody unless you think they're marriage material, which would include being a Christian, being a serious Christian, not just, oh, I go to church at Christmas and Easter, blah, blah, blah. Or I do the pray at the poll, the poll thing, see you at the poll. Somebody who you can tell by their character, this person wants to follow God. Well, that would change a lot. Because I know for me, we had the conversation before we were even married. Divorce is not an option. It's not an option. Now, that was easy for us to say. We were two believers who, for the most part, pulling in the same direction. Yes. <laughs> he said he said it's easy for you to say <laughs> verses 13 through 16 they were bringing children to him that he might touch them you see a recurring theme here and the disciples rebuked them but when Jesus saw it he was indignant and said to them let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. I don't want to take much time on this. I think the message here is fairly clear. Children were important to Jesus. They should be important to us. What do you think is the most important thing we could do for children? What's the most important thing? Lead them to God. How do we do that? Pray. We pray. Set an example. Teach them. How do we teach them? <laughs> Don't give them everything they want. That's true. You know what? Yes, that is. Oh, yeah. And boy, and they'll ask questions you don't know the answer to. And you know what you do when they say that? When they do, you say, "I don't know. I will you find the answer." <laughs> That's right. I got to share this. I'm going to eat into my own time here, but I have to share it. I've been preaching about evangelism for the last six, six or seven weeks, and I think it's actually making a little bit of an impact on our kids because there's this family that moved in next door to us, what, about a month ago? No, been, been there several months. We just moved them. Oh, okay. Well, the COVID kept us inside, kept them inside. Yes. But there's a little girl that comes over and plays with Salem. Her name's uh, Kaylee. And Salem and Malika both invited her and her family to church tonight and Sunday, uh, especially because of the dress-up thing on Sunday. Which, uh, so maybe they'll come. But I just thought, hey, you're right. She sponged it, and then she rang it out a little bit. All right, uh, verses 17 to 31, very quickly. You know what? I'm not going to read this. It would take probably three or four minutes just to read these verses. But you know the story. The rich, what? The rich young ruler. He comes to Jesus and says, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, basically, keep the commandments. He says, hey, I'm your boy, <laughs> which is totally baloney. Nobody has kept all the commandments. But in his mind, he thought he had it covered. And then Jesus said what? He looked at him and said, one thing you lack. And you know what? This is similar to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. One thing you can't do. And boy, as soon as he told him that, it's like, ah! 
ah, I gotta eat that. And then he said to this guy, one thing you lack. Now, first of all, the elephant in the room is Jesus saying that we have to sell everything. Is this, is this passage prescriptive or descriptive? Is it describing something that happened it here, or is it prescribing a form of life for us? Prescribing. I'm going to say D. Yes. Well, in that sense, he's prescribing all of us, but he's not necessarily saying that we all have to sell everything and go. I mean, first of all, Jesus is not walking among us. We can't follow him literally, right? He can't be moved, but does it always have to be? No. No. However, Jesus is here because verses 23 to 31 sort of crystallize the issue. Yeah, we can make anything an idol. I could make that laptop an idol. I could make my phone an idol. I could make the cowboys an idol, even though it's much easier this year not to do that. However, <laughs> however, um, still got to wear my shirt, still got to wear my shirt. Money presents a different set of problems for people, the human heart. I think I will read 23 to 31. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Look at the disciples' response. They were amazed. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. They still couldn't believe it. They were exceedingly astonished. I don't even know what that exactly means. It's like, <laughs> what make your exceedingly astonished face. What does it look like? I don't know. They couldn't believe it. They said to him, who can be saved? Now, before we read any, anything further, what is the implicit understanding that disciples are carrying here? Rephrase what they said. Put it in your own words. You know what I think they're saying? They're saying, if a rich person can't be saved, then who can? Now, what's the implicit misunderstanding there? That having a lot of money was some kind of evidence that you were right with God. Oh, wait a minute. We just nailed the prosperity gospel right there. Because if you turn on the TV or turn on the Internet, you will find buku pastors saying things like, just God's favor is coming upon you. And yeah, that's true. But you get to the end of the message, and God's favor is always defined as that job promotion, which leads to more money. Uh, that, fill in the blank, that, uh, that health, they, call it, they don't call it the health, wealth, gospel for nothing, do they? The prosperity gospel. Their understanding, you see, you've got to take in the Old Testament understanding here. In the Old Testament, by the way, this is absolutely true, and we shouldn't diminish this. God said to the Old Testament Hebrews, if you obey me, I will bless you. How? He said, I will give you plenty of crops, which for them was what? Money. Your, your cattle will have babies? Money. You, you, I will bless you. They called it a land of milk and honey. That was like... That'd be like us saying the land of uh, coffee and Reese's. I mean, that's, you're talking my language. But Jesus, there. Money itself is not evil. No. What we do with money. That's exactly right. But their understanding seemed to be if you have a lot of money, then you must be living right because God is blessing you. And that was not true. That was not true. It wasn't true then. It's not true now. Look at what Jesus responds. He looked at him and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God. By the way, it's not just the salvation of rich people that's impossible without God. It's the salvation of anybody. Jesus said in the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5, Blessed are the what? The poor in spirit, not necessarily the poor in money. Because not having money doesn't make you right with God. If it did, all of those poor people in India that live on the trash heaps would go straight to heaven when they die, and they're not. For all things are possible with God. Let's go down to verse 32. 
They were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. By the way, uh, just to put it into context, this is the last time they would go to Jerusalem. If you look over at chapter 11, that describes the triumphal entry, which is one week before his, uh, his passion and crucifixion. That's right. So this is, the last, this is the last road to Jerusalem. They were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen, saying, See, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. After three days he will arise. And then James and John make their little request. You know what's really interesting to this about me? Or about this to me? <laughs> um, if you go back to chapter 9, verse 30, he foretells his death for the second time. And then right after that, what do they argue about? Who's the greatest? And then here, for the third time, the final time, he tells them, I'm going to be crucified. crucified. I'm going to die, and I'm going to rise again. And immediately, what was it about that conversation piece that made them think about who was going to be in charge? Maybe, maybe they were thinking, well, he's going to die. I'll, I'll take some, you know, somebody's got to take his place. But then again, look at what they said. We want you to do something for us. Go down to uh, verse 37. They said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. I'm starting to really believe that they did take his word at face value. He was going to die. He was going to rise again. But that then they would serve beside him. Which does, You know, the only thing that doesn't make any sense about it is that the night he was betrayed, what did they do? Right. They split. But they don't seem to be concerned here about the fact that he's going to lose his life. That, that no, they don't. They don't the Bible, seem to be. The Bible said that their minds are being clouded toward the degree so they won't understand it. They didn't understand well, that's it true. Later. That's true. And, and, they did, and they would. But he says to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink it, the cup? And they said yes, verse 39. But he says, you're going to drink it. But you're not going to sit at my right hand and my left. And of course, verse 41, the rest of them got ticked off. But Jesus said, this is the key verses. You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, but it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom. For many. Greatness requires sacrifice. Uh, the disciples again wrongly envisioned glory without grief, honor without horror, success without suffering. And that's not how that's not how the Christian life is portrayed by Jesus, by any of the apostles. Read the book of Acts, it was not a bed of roses for them. Following Jesus cost them everything. And that's basically what Jesus is saying here. If you're going to follow me, if you, he said, but he, basically when they said, we want to sit at your right hand and your left, they were saying, we want authority. Mm -hmm. I mean, Jesus is described as being at the right hand of God. Why does it use that language when God does not have a hand? God the Father, right? He's a spirit. He does not have a body. So why does it use that language? Because Jesus has authority. He sits at the place of authority. He does whatever he wants. And Matthew 28 makes that abundantly clear. All authority is given unto me. So they're saying, we want authority. And whoever sits at the right hand has a little bit more. Maybe, that's, maybe that was the real point of contention. Who are you going to put at your right hand, me or him? They had a brotherly squabble. Leadership, though, looks different in the kingdom. I thought of this. You know, Christian leadership means getting in the mud. Matt will be able to... Uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Identify with this. I've known chaplains in the military who all they did is sit in their office. They didn't go out with the soldiers. If there was a, if there was a, you know, uh, a ruck run, they just stayed in their office. Oh, you know, I got, I got important work to do. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, you might have important work to do, but don't they too? Res soldiers respect you a lot more, and they listen to you a lot more if you do what they're doing. And I think Jesus is saying here, whoever would be first among you must become a slave. You've got to get down in the mud 
with those that you want to lead. Paul, in his epistles, calls himself a what? A slave, over and over and over again. And, uh, you know, I would just say, especially if you're in a position of leadership here, if you're a man, you are, by definition, in uh, some sort of leadership. But even if you're a woman, if you're in a position of leadership, don't be afraid to do the things that you ask other people to do. Don't be afraid to do it. That's the only way they'll follow. Verses 46 to 50, and we are done. And guess what? You did it. You did the entire chapter plus a little bit of chapter 9. Somebody else, read verses 46 to 50. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, this is pretty interesting. Um, so, in chapter 8, verse 22, just look back at that real quick. In chapter 8, verse 22, what happens? Somebody tell me. First person to get there. He heals. What's wrong with Bartimaeus? Or I'm sorry, what's wrong with this guy at Bethesda? He is blind. And then he heals Bartimaeus, who is blind. In between those two miracles, we find over and over again blindness that is spiritual in nature. We find the disciples, not understanding. Remember, right after he heals the man at Bethesda, Peter says, you are the Christ, and it seems like they're getting over the hump, and then right after that, Peter pulls him aside and says, you're not going to suffer, and he has to just rip Peter up to shreds in front of everybody. There was a spiritual blindness there. Then the transfiguration, later in chapter 9. You would think this mountaintop experience would open their eyes, but we need to make a shrine for you and Moses and Elijah. There's still spiritual blindness. And then he heals a boy with an unclean spirit later in chapter 9. And these, this is a little boy that the other disciples were not able to cast out of him. More spiritual blindness. Verse 32, after he foretells his death a second time. They did not understand the saying, and they were afraid to ask him, and they immediately began arguing about who is the greatest. Verse 38, they see somebody doing miracles, but they're, he's not following Jesus physically. They're, spiritually, they're too spiritually dull to see that this man is doing the work of God. I just find it fascinating that these two accounts of Jesus healing physical blindness are sandwich, they sandwich all this spiritual blindness, and I think Mark is trying to tell us something. I think he's trying to tell us that Jesus wants to hear, heal our spiritual blindness. He can heal our spiritual blindness. But what does it take? Verse 52. Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And then right after that, um, he makes his way into Jerusalem in what we call the triumphal entry, which is kind of a I don't know, it's, it's kind of a, an ironic turn of phrase. But from our standpoint, it really was. He triumphed through death. He triumphed through the cross. But it was not what they were expecting. They were still spiritually blind until his resurrection. And I think there's a key, there's a lesson there for us too. Until we accept the resurrection by faith, which we would call salvation, getting saved, being regenerated, there's a certain spiritual blindness that affects us. Any final thoughts before we close up shop with one minute to spare on any of the subjects we touched tonight? By the way, just real quick, was this a distraction to you going that fast, or was it kind of was it cool to do something different? I think it's all familiar scripture. 
Yeah, that's true. That's true. We've all read Mark before. <laughs> what question? Which one? Oh, well, I don't want to put her on the spot. <laughs> so I did answer that question. Oh, you yeah. did? Yes, I did. Catherine, did I answer your question earlier about... So the answer is, if you've repented of your sins, you're no longer in adultery. Yes. And faithfully. Faithfully married. Faithfully married. Listen, we may get to heaven... And God judges things completely different than the way I do, than the way I interpret. God might, we might get to heaven and say, you lived in adultery for 40 years or whatever the case is. I don't know. But the way I see it is once you repent of a sin, you might live with the ramifications of that sin, but you won't be held guilty of that sin. There is therefore now no condemnation, right? That's what Romans 8, 1 says. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What consequences of it? What consequences, of course. You know, I can't go to Krispy Kreme every day for three years and then repent, and all my weight's gone the next day. I got work to do. Let's pray. Actually, Chatty, would you close some prayer?